If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 39 minutes, Justin, Adam, and I do mm-hmm. our current event first. intro conversation. First, we do a little competition. We do the childhood cartoon Stupid theme song. You call that a competition? Competition. <laughs> it was a blowout. Yeah. Uh, we talk about our childhood crushes. Hey, Debbie Gibson. Uh, we talk about <laughs> c- Ireland. celebrity you. endorsed products or shams. Tom Brady. <laughs> we talk about the Juve light. This is the far infrared light that Adam is using on his skin at the moment. If you go to Juve, that's J O O V V dot com forward slash mind pump, they'll actually give you a massive discount. We also talk about the Amazon, uh, Amazon Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan uh, healthcare com- combination. So they're coming together, they're trying to create a new healthcare system for Amazon employees. Very disruptive. Look out, Kaiser. Whoa. Very exciting. Let's see what happens. Look out, Taking here she comes. Megalithic. Oh, that one, Justin. Uh, yep. Whoa, here she comes. There she is. Watch out, boss. She'll chew you up. I love that. Yeah. Uh, we talk about how Adam, Adam, he didn't even know this happened. First one out of all of us that made it to Joe Rogan. Boom. He oh, had, man. He didn't even know what Who's happened. Who's your daddy? And he appeared on the Rogan show. We had a little pot going on, just so you guys all know. I won right there. He, First person to get on Joe Rogan. He won oh. the pot. Uh, then we talk about the Organifi Kermit blend, which is the green juice and gold juice, and the Christmas blend, which is the red juice and green juice. If you mix them up, you get uh, different effects, different flavors. Uh, try it out yourself. If you go to OrganifiShop.com and enter the code MINDPUMP without a space, you'll get a discount. And then I talked about my weight gainer shake recipe that I had this morning. It's like 800 calories of pure creamy awesomeness. Beefcake. Then we talked about sex shops and Christmas gifts. Don't we always? Trust me, you want Adam at your white elephant party. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, what are the it's benefits- as big as a white elephant. What are the benefits of pause reps? This is when you're taking your repetition through its normal range of motion, and then you <clears> stop- <throat> You stop halfway through or at the bottom or at the top or something. Are there benefits of that or are you just looking funny in the gym? That's really the question. Uh, I can't do it. Oh, the, I can. The next question was uh, when you're training, how come sometimes everything feels super heavy and on other days you feel like everything's super light? What the hell is going on? Is it recovery? Is it nutrition? Is it the full moon? That might have an effect on oh, you. It could be it's that. It's the tides. We had the blood moon, right? The yeah, two, the 200 blood. years? <laughs> we did. It's that time. Bloody moon. Yeah, it's that menstruation. The next question was, how do you break a bad habit? You know, Justin goes into a personal uh, experience, how he used to bite his toenails. How did mm. he stop biting that's, all, that's pretty flexible. His toenails. You got to give me that. Or is he still doing it? I'll give you a little clue. He just started biting other people's toenails. <laughs> and the final question what are our thoughts on the best personality types for those in the fitness industry? Like, what category of personalities of people do the best in fitness? Is Usually it, the ones that aren't assholes. Is it extroverts? Is it introverts? It's not is necessarily it, true. Is it nymphomaniacs? One of those three. <laughs> oh, some assholes make it We too. pick That's one true. of those three. Also, we mention uh, Maps Prime a lot in this episode. Now, listen. It's like, listen, are you? why do you not have this? I don't. Care it's offensive. What workout you're it's doing? Money back guaranteed. I do not care what workout you're doing. I mean, I do care, but you could choose to do whatever you want. You can do whatever workout you want. By not having it, you're saying fuck you, mind pump. Prime. This would actually make CrossFit okay. That's it. Prime can make any I, workout you're doing. I don't agree with that statement. Better. <laughs> so it's like a pre-workout, except it works, uh, and it's less expensive. You get. Maps Prime. It teaches you how to prime your body properly for your workout. So it teaches you what to do before your workout based on your own body's movement patterns. Yes, it is totally individualized, 100% to your body. Once you prime your body properly, now you're going to squeeze out more out of your workout. So think of it this way. Imagine if your potential is 100. Well, you're probably only getting 70 out of your workout. Maps Prime could help you get that Full, uh, full potential out of your workout. And it's just really adding what you do before your workout. So throw your normal warm-up away and do some priming and do it the right way. Get that 100. Now, if you have any questions 
on Maps Prime or any of our other programs and bundles, because we have quite a bit, here's what you do. You go to uh, mindpumpmedia.com. Click on the program you have the question on. There'll be a friendly video with a super good looking guy who's going to explain <laughs> to you what the programs got awesome dad here. are all about. And if you're serious, then enroll. Again, mindpumpmedia.com. Okay, we're going to play a short game between Adam and Justin. Mm. You guys are going to be competing. Okay. Okay. As soon as this these songs come on. Oh, come on, dude. This <laughs> not a fair game. You, no, no, this one should be close no, to fair. It's right. not even a fair game. Uh, hold on. I'm going to give you two points already. Cool. We'll play, we'll play fucking <laughs> wow. NBA and NFL trivia afterwards, and we'll okay. see how I do. <laughs> so you're, you're already two points ahead of Justin. Oh, already? Yeah, I'm oh, going to give you a bus. Well, come on, dude. I have a handicap? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, affirmative yeah. action with this. Here. We're going to give you a fucking affirmative action. We're going to give you I don't want a fucking handout. Let's go. All right, all right. Zero, zero. Let's go. Ready? Let's go. All right, here we go. Oh, my God. Here we go. Transformers. Very good, Justin. Transformers it is. I just guessed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. What? It's either, That's Voltron, obviously... it's either Voltron or All Transformers. All right, here we go. Ready? Next oh, we're one. Do- what are we doing right now? You, you have to guess the, the cartoon. Oh. Next one. Scooby-Doo. Cats? Scooby-Doo. Oh, Masters of the Universe. From of the universe. No, it's Voltron. That is Voltron. Yeah. Very good, Justin. <laughs> two zero. Oh, Hold shit. on, I'll find the next one. We'll do we'll do two more and then we'll stop. <laughs> Dude, I was Come watching on, these all night last night, just losing my mind. Were you watching? All right, here's a hard one. Or what? Here's a hard one. This one's mm. tough. You might not know this. Wasn't as popular. Same same years? Yeah. Same era. Oh my god, mask. Yes! Yeah. Dude, the, to I don't the, even remember I that. Dude, that, that cartoon one. was crazy. Mask. Did you ever remember. watch Mask? No, I didn't. Yeah. So I didn't remember Mask either. And then oh, I'm, yeah. I'm watching. I found this video, this YouTube video. It's called Ultimate 80s and 90s Retro Cartoon Intros. <laughs> so yeah. I'm watching this and um, I'm like freaking out because you're just getting all these weird feelings that you had when you were a kid. And Mask was one that I didn't watch a lot of, so it wasn't something that was oh, burned in my into memory. Mask, dude, I had all the action figures and everything. Bro, that was a sick cartoon. I'm looking at the intro. I'm like, they did a good job. You know, cartoons suck nowadays. Let's just let's just talk yeah. about that for a second. Yeah, me, and my, just, my kids watch all the old ones. All right, Adam, you ready? I don't know. Get I'm, fast. <laughs> Get fast. I might just give you this one. Get fast, okay. He man, oh, come on! Yeah, uh, it's come too on. easy. That's all right. I had to give him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I was I was watching uh, like uh, Ducktales, Tailspin, Gummy Bears, fucking uh, yeah. GI Joe, Gummy Bears, Garfield. Yeah. Those were my cartoons, man. Yeah, yeah. X Men. I liked all the X Men cartoons. That was like the power ballad of power. Did you guys? Ballads. So you, so there were the the prototypical male. Cartoons when we were kids, right? There was like He Man, yeah. G. And then like Joe. Jim came on after that, and you're like, yes, ah, turn this shit. Really? Off. Oh yeah, I like Jim. I mean, I she like, was truly outrageous. She was. I like Jim. I like yeah. watching Jim. I had a crush yeah. on Jim. I never even seen that one. She-ra. What was your first? So this is. So this took me down a rabbit hole of looking up old TV shows and shit, and uh, I remembered my first celebrity crush, my very first one. Really, Punky Brewster. Yeah. Punky, really? Soleil Moon Fry. Yeah. Soleil Moon Fry. Her parents she, she weren't, they weren't hippies at all. No. Do you guys remember Punky Brewster? Of course. I do remember. I didn't really have a thing for her, though. Oh, I no. did. Who was your first crush? I, I more had a thing for that robot chick. Remember that, that one that would like, oh, lift things? Oh, shit. Hold on. Let me think. Um, God, what was the song to that? I don't know. Uh, she, Small Wonder. Small, small, small Wonder. wonder. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. Damn. As a, as a young just, boy, I didn't have a I didn't have a celebrity crush. I was never really the only no little, one on TV, no girl on TV. The o- high school, I like my or eighth grade, ninth grade. I had the the Britney Spears crush because oh, of the, this fucking school dress outfit <laughs> song that she came out on. That was game well, over. Yeah, that was the best because like everybody had uh, plaid skirts after that. Yeah, you know? I was like, thank you. Yes, Britney the Spears. tall socks were this influence. <laughs> she so, did do something nice for the society before. Yeah. Before that, though, I really did, and even today like really I, before that you didn't have any i'm just i don't follow um but you didn't watch tv and there was a girl or something that you were like no or a guy whatever we're not gonna judge you <laughs> no <laughs> i didn't i, I mean I, of course about? i watched shows and watching the, oh she's hot oh this but 
you know, a lot of people, especially when we were younger, I mean, they had posters of people, their crushes and things, you know, in their room. Like, that was a cool thing. Oh, like, man. Uh, yeah. talk- the only one I would think is, like, like Kelly from uh, uh, Saved by the Bell. Saved by the Bell. Dude, she was hot. I yeah. had, so I actually had posters. I had two of them. Really? Yeah, I did. I have two of them, and I never put oh, them up because I was too- I, had- I was too- No, not Punky Brewster. That's when I was really young. Yeah. So that's when I was just, I didn't even know it was a crush. I was just like, what's this weird feeling yeah. I have in my loins? But yeah. there was, there were two posters that I got from, do you remember the carnival when it would come into town and it would be at a school, the, you know, the gangster ones, right? With the, the zipper. zipper. And the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they always had that game where you could throw the, the dart into the balloons and get a poster. I was really good at that game. Everybody yeah. was. The balloons were all next to each other. Like you guaranteed to get a poster. Basically they're selling you put shit posters for five bucks. It was $5 to throw a dart. So anyway, yeah. I got, I figured that out later Pretty on. I was much. like, wait a minute. Yeah, I can go buy this. So anyway, I remember I got two posters because this, and this is my first time like actually buying something of like a girls that I thought were attractive. So I must have been 12. I was too embarrassed to put them up, but it was two girls. It was Debbie Gibson and Tiffany. Remember Tiffany? <laughs> oh, wow. The mall tour. Remember that? 1980, yeah. whatever. I don't be- even know if they're before hot. Before there was, bef- there used to be a store, and I can't think of the name of it, but it was before Spencer's, but it was like the Spencer's before Spencer's, the stuff that kind of had like the edgy stuff. And as a kid, I had bought hmm. all the posters. Remember when the posters, they used to be on the, they, you could flip through them. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you could see what yeah, they were yeah, then yeah. underneath. You, oh, E16. I want yeah, that yeah, one. yeah, yeah. So I had I had a lot of posters in my room, but they were all like new kids on the block. No, 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 no. I was in, <laughs> like I was all into the models and shit, dude. So yeah. they were all like hot chicks. Oh, so who was your favorite model? Oh, I didn't have yeah. it. See, but I was Christy in, Brinkley. And I mean, I had Carmen Electra up there, and I had Kathy Pamela Ireland, Pamela, Kathy Ander, Ireland Pamela great, Anderson, yeah. and but I I didn't. I didn't have a lot of like big name girls that I was into. It was like the po- if the poster was cool, I was, if, and of course it was like some girl you know scrubbing a Ferrari in her fucking <laughs> you know it's la- la- it's wash the you. ultimate American <laughs> dream. <laughs> oh, for sure, I had like six different posters just like the white that, you know? snake girl yeah, that's like totally dude, washing the red Ferrari. It's soap bubbles all over her tits. Oh like, my god! That, I remember my parents were pissed when god, I bought those. Those were the days, yeah, innocent days. Yeah, where you put posters. Well, of chicks that was on. like, I mean, that was our. I had I had. Well, you know, so I had shit like that. I had no, I had no posters of girls up because I was embarrassed to put them up. But instead, I had pictures of fucking bodybuilders up. So you can imagine, my- <laughs> <laughs> all your friends come over. Yeah, yeah. my parents are kind of like, hmm, wow, I, yeah, this is I'm strange. A little worried, my boy. I yeah. don't know. He likes to read encyclopedias and look at pictures of <laughs> buff men, buff greasy guys. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I remember Kathy Ireland was really she was fucking huge. Oh, dude, Cindy, Cindy Crawford. Cindy Crawford. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and she's she's remained hot you know even into her whatever now 50 60s she was, i'm trying to remember who was like the ultimate hot then there was that music video by um chris isaac oh, yeah. uh what is that sh- fuck what's that video yeah uh um i never feel this way yeah that one <laughs> yeah, that one <laughs> you feel this way. whatever the girl's name what is I I do. oh my god i don't remember that no i yeah, that was I don't want to fall in love. The girl that yeah. was in that video <laughs> yeah. made me lose my mind. She was she was very I can't very believe hot. you could remember songs like that on on Bro, call. I, I it took me a second. It's a I, random talent you I have. I probably it's, it's my only talent. I'm pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> you ask my wife. <laughs> oh, why, why ask her? Uh, don't, don't ask her. I uh, um I 100% use the image of that video. Several times. Wow. In my, yeah, growing That's up. That's good. Used that video. <laughs> for what? <laughs> motivation? Huh? For motivation? <laughs> yeah. A lot of motivation. For some stand-up dude, dude, uh, if, material. If, I've, if I'm ever on a game show and they give me, the, they tell me like, all right, write down the names of people you want to call in case we need you to answer yeah, like a yeah, trivia yeah. question, you're for sure on there. Justin. Okay, I mean for sure. Oh yeah, for that stuff. Yeah, you're Absolutely. a good friend too, Adam. Very supportive. Like you're a fucking, you're my boy. But <laughs> you would be sports trivia guy. You gotta, you gotta yes. quiz him on that. I give you that the sport. That's true. He, he probably kills me. On we that. would do the sports trivia. Yeah, we never even go that way because you don't even know where to ask. I a know question. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play well, a game. Let's do music because yeah, I fucking watch cartoons, Almanac, but I can't ask yeah. you a fucking sports. I got question. A, I got a question. <laughs> I was actually really, you know what's crazy? which ball is the one that you bounce with your hands? Go! Oh my god! <laughs> Yesterday uh, on with Mike Matthews, uh, we got into some sports. I didn't realize that he he was a sports fan. Yeah, I, oh. I thought he was such a nerd like you that he Uh-oh. didn't watch any wow. sports. But yeah. he still is a nerd, but he's not. Yeah, he's not that kind of nerd. He's a little bit cooler. He's got nerd. some sports it's, in his. Nerd. Yeah, it was actually pretty cool to be able to talk to him a little bit about that. We talked about the Tom Brady uh, stuff. You know. Um, 
God, who was going to tell you guys about that? Somebody brought something up to me. Son of a bitch. It was regarding the shirt. More about his training and his shirt? Yeah, it was more around uh, along uh, those lines. Shirt. And I forgot what the fuck I wanted to tell you guys. I hate that when I when I have something that I want to tell you guys like the night before, and I'm like, oh, I got to remember you that. You got to write it down. I got to remember that. <laughs> was it just talking about the technology of it and the, uh, yeah, la- the and, lack of technology? Yeah, yeah that. And we were, I, far I know, infrared. I, we were just talking about everything, his whole protocol and everything he's doing, because it, it never fails. You know, when somebody somebody's super famous like this, gets you know puts out their their diet their routine yeah. How, like, wow he's really good he's handsome and he has a supermodel uh, wife uh yeah. whatever you're doing let's go ahead and package that i always wonder too like so you know did under armor have the idea that they wanted to create this technology or did they have the foresight to say tom brady's 40 years old He's broken all these records. People are going to be like, "How are you doing it?" That's that was that's yeah. been the buzz on the radio for the last two years. How's Tom Brady having some of the best best games of his life this at this age? HRV and, isn't that sexy, right? Like, so, so I always wonder that. Else. Did 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 Under Armour go? Let's create a product that we can attach to them versus let's come up with this revolutionary product and then find somebody to market it. Yes. I, I believe they I don't think they broke I don't think they invented some revolutionary product no, and then I, tried to come no, up. No, I think they actually they make a work. deal make a deal with Tom Brady and think how can we create a product that aligns with like his message of and we course. Start, yeah. They probably you, sat in a meeting together and then yeah. just like right. mind map. A hundred percent. Think about it. You have an athlete who is defying the odds. Uh, is very well liked, and you're thinking to yourself, what can we create around this and attach to him? Now, you're a clothing company, so the obvious answer is cool clothes. But there's nothing different about that, and there's nothing about the clothes that you could hint towards better performance, and everybody's talking about his performance. Right. So it makes sense that that's what I would do if I was in this being like, what product can we come up with that's clothing, but that also could potentially contribute, or we could say contributes to performance and it and then attach it to you who everybody's right blown away with your performance it's it, it, let's invent clothes it's that. almost obvious to me because when you think of, i mean it's no different than the bodybuilding world i mean this is what they do they find a bodybuilder who goes pro or wins a show and then they tell them you know hey market this supplement it's like motherfucker never took any of that to get to that point yeah. all of a sudden now he's posting it every every fourth picture now, is you, uh is his supplement you, you know what's funny about yeah. that is uh i think bodybuilders pro bodybuilders have lost that power Oh, they have. They, they, uh-huh. they, they've well, lost a lot of that power because it's oversaturated. Well, now. not just oversaturated, but everybody, most people now know that they're on a lot of drugs, yeah, it's like steroids. Yeah. So yeah. nobody now, like, if a bodybuilder is like, "Oh my god, I did this new thing, and this is why I built so much muscle," people don't believe him anymore. It's not like that with pro sports quite as much. Like with pro sports, people still look at that and don't think necessarily right away genetics and drugs. They think, "Oh shit, he's doing something different, something new." And, um, you know, so they have more power in that sense. Right. Bodybuilders used to have that power. You know, if Arnold or Lee Haney said, this is the shake that I take, yeah. or Dorian... Well, you there's know, a lot more mystery back then. Yeah. Uh, like, how they were getting so, like, gorilla-sized, you know? Like, it was it was <laughs> just this, like, magical process where we were just, like, in awe. Like, oh, my God, this guy's fucking huge. Mm-hmm, he must mm-hmm. be... Yeah, of course he's using that protein. And, you know, he's he's getting shredded all of a sudden because he's using Xenadrine. Yeah, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I just think it's funny that the, you know you're, we're going to attach this product to Tom Brady, who has played probably you know thirty years of his life and has never even wore the shirt. But yeah. n- now it'll be on commercials all over the place, and everybody will be talking about. Yeah, this has really been working for me yeah, uh, the yeah. last month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. Like you just pretty came sure, up with this shit. Pretty sure I would have had to retire at thirty nine, but I know I got at least another I'll year tell or two. You what, I'm going to go another decade now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to call it. Yeah. Now that would be some shit, right? Yeah. Like that. That's what would be like game changer. Like this guy that's also the pitch, right? Yeah, yeah, Fifty yeah. years old throwing the ball. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say growth hormone. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to say growth, growth hormone, <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. That does work. You can't test for that, right? They don't have a test for growth mm-hmm. hormone. Do they? I don't think they do. I don't. I don't know. I don't know the NFL. That'd be a great question. Ask Brendan. I'll ask him what that. What the. What it is if they're testing for that. I think now. they can only test for the the testosterone and the testosterone derivatives. Yeah. I don't think they have. A, I totally see, think this is where I'm like, I, I pff, dude, growth hormone. Come on, like, give the guy something. You know, these oh, I, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I agree. God damn, they're getting their asses. Bro, he's older than I am. Being somebody who's taking it, it's not like this. 
I think HGH is one of those things that is overrated as far as what people think it does for you. You think that you're going to take it and be like, oh. It's, no, no, no. Because yeah, you hear not, people say it all the time, like, oh, I guarantee he's on this and he's on HGH for sure. Like, yeah, he probably is, but the HGH doesn't make this guy superhuman. I mean, no, of course not. It's like the, it would. But it, if you've been on it, you know, if he's been on it for four or five years. It's the fountain of youth. Yeah, it should yeah. help. That's what, what I noticed from it more than anything else. Like, first of all, it took almost six months before – I really felt, and the first time I ever did HGH was almost, I don't know, six years ago or so. And luckily I had somebody who was telling me, they're like, listen, you're, you're going to take this. You're not going to feel all crazy. So I was ready for it to not like feel that way. Uh, and he said, it'll take a while before you, you really feel it in your system. And you'll notice like things like energy and sleep and your fingernails and hair growth and, you know, skin and stuff like that. That's what I noticed. And the biggest thing that like that stood out to me was I consistently woke up just with more energy than I ever used to. Like I'm a, so I've talked on the show before that I'm a slow riser and I'm a night guy. I'm not really a morning person. Something about the HGH just gave me these incredible nights of sleep and I would wake up just ready to start my day. It made me feel, it reminded me of being kind of 17 again where you felt invincible, where you didn't even need a, a consistent sleep every night. You would wake up the next morning and feel you know, mm. fresh, you're on spry. So that's what I, I noticed that. And then like my fingernails, I was having to clip my nails every week because they were just growing out of control. Like they were, I'm, it was crazy how Weird. fast they were growing. So I noticed those two things. Yeah. So you figure he's, he's older if, and the things that will plague someone who's older is like joint pain mainly, right? Joint yeah. pain and stiffness. So in that regard, it's got to help him a lot, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Yeah. And he's making enough money and, you know, he's got so enough on the line that, I wouldn't blame them at all. Well, There's the whole lying factor. Dude, athletes now, they with the amount of money they have, the resources that they have, I mean, they just they're on the most cutting edge of everything. They're all using infrared, they're all using cryotherapy, uh, they're all halo uh, technology. Dude, they're their, they're using everything. Yeah. And and again, you know, it, what it reminds me of is like when we used to talk about Ben Greenfield is it makes sense for somebody like that who's taking all that's doing all the other stuff it's not mm -hmm. like tom brady is wearing a fucking infrared shirt and doing cryo and doing those things like that but then he's out fucking eating shitty food partying all night long or whatever you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. okay so he's he's optimizing all, almost all aspects of his life so okay it gets it makes sense to throw some of these things in there to to completely max out where the average consumer who's like looking for that competitive edge, like, oh, you know, I want to try this out. Like, yeah. yeah, and I've gotten ton of people inboxing me about the Juve because I've been doing the Juve, and you know, I seem to be seeing some positive benefits, uh, more so with my psoriasis than I am noticing my libido. My libido doesn't seem to be, uh, I, at least, it doesn't feel like it's a major spike from it. Uh, but I do notice skin and, and psoriasis, and I actually notice that pretty fast. How long will you be using it for? Just well, it's I'm, it's at my house now, so I've been consistently doing it in the morning and in the night. Okay. Well, if you bring it back, just wipe it. Yeah, wipe down. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't hump it. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you're like six to two, yeah, yeah, on it. Yeah, I don't know if you're like laying. I'm pretty sure it says don't hump this. Yeah. Stay six to twelve I, inches away. Yeah, I don't know it if is, you're just you're like resting just, it on like, it. Hugs you know it mean? like bear hugs yeah, it. Yeah, if you like. I, I, just, when's like, our infrared sauna getting in here? Oh yeah. That's I don't know. That's your connection. What's going on? Should be soon. I don't know. I said we set it up, so it should be here pretty soon. Oh, it's like it's supposed to be on its way? I believe so, right? Yep. yep. Oh, I'm so yep. Yeah, That'll be that. cool. That'll I'm be so. very fun. So you want some current events? Some current events news? Do current the, events! How about, do the news song. How about Apple? <laughs> I don't know. I gotta got come up with one for that. <laughs> you, ready, you ready for yeah. Apple, the rival Kaiser, or what? No, it's Amazon. Or Amazon, Amazon. excuse me. Amazon. So Amazon, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan. So you have Amazon and two large investment companies are teaming up to create a healthcare company or healthcare type company for Amazon. Boom. Yes. This is great. Man, where did you hear Competitive this? Competitive healthcare. This, you know, it's funny what that they would start doing this. Yeah. Oh, it's, come on, bro. It's obvious. It has to. You know why? The market. The why is it when you call something, Longo, it's so fucking amazing, but then when, when I call something, it's obvious? What? <laughs> it was only obvious to me. <laughs> was it, was you was treat it, thought it was yeah. obvious. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Duh. Uh, obviously. I'm a real they're outside they're of the going box in that direction. Predictor. When I was 13, I wrote a paper yeah. on it. Yeah. 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 Salstradamus. No, no here's, here's, com. here's why it's obvious from an economic point of view. You have such uh, high, high market pressures coming from 
a field of our economy that the prices are so skewed and so distorted because of the crony capitalism that exists within it that there's going to be a market response. And what I mean by that is when you have, if, if all water all of a sudden was taxed so high that it was super, super, super expensive, you would find uh, the market would try to find a solution because the, the market pressure to find a solution mm -hmm. Yeah, but when, so you, when you start getting into medical and education and things like that, it's not that fucking obvious because it's not that fucking easy, bro. Oh, no, it's, it's not, not as simple as oh, like, no. oh, look at the market is, is demanding it, so watch it happen. It's like, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fucking regulation well, that's, that's put in place to keep that. megalithic industries, right. yeah. Well, yeah. that's just need change. That's exactly, why, change. that's exactly why it's taken this long because, right, right. and why it's taken this much of a distortion in the prices because it's it's fucking crazy man you get a, an ambulance ride will cost you over ten thousand dollars or five thousand dollars it makes no sense whatsoever and it and it's, the reason why it doesn't make sense is because it doesn't make sense the the prices are so distorted in our healthcare precisely because of all the weird ways that government intrudes into the market and creates all these weird demands or all these or these weird you know uh it basically it's distorted as fuck so because the prices are so high, now you've got companies who are willing to try to navigate this complex, you know, regulatory system that we have for for healthcare. And they don't by the way, the stock market didn't like it. Amazon, mm. when they talked about this, their stock dropped. Because really? people yeah. Like, be, just because it's such a beast to tackle. Well, dude, it's it's one of the most there's a few markets in the well, US that are heavily regulated, and that's one of them. Yeah. Is they're they're probably also going to take a major loss to make it happen too. Yeah, I mean, that's of typically what they 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 do. I mean, but that's what I love Amazon's about Bezos. Like, He's not scared of that. Yeah, you no. know, he'll take on the impossible like that and really try. Bro, to Bezos make and Elon Musk, there. man, those are my my two dudes right there. Bro, I mean, they have a threesome. It's yeah. a, it, it is incredible to see like what he's willing to take on. You know, and like right. and, and disrupt the whole process with that. Yeah, so. it'll it'll be. I mean, there's there's definitely some laws that need to change. You know, like it, there's you could go to a physician's assistant for a lot of the things you go to a doctor for. You could definitely have a pharmacist give you things that you have to go get prescription for. You know, this it's just it's crazy how expensive we made things. And those are just two silly examples. Then there's all these regulations that make competing insurance companies. Not able to I think it's because completely to silly. I should be able to go. I should be able to go see you and you be my doctor if I want to. If I'm stupid enough to let you fucking, <laughs> you know, be my doctor, sure, that, why not though? I mean, I don't understand why that. Why it just makes no sense to me. You know? Yeah. No. It's like she, I should have that right to be able to say like, hey, you know what? Sal's a really smart guy, and even though he didn't go to med school, I feel confident that he can help diagnose this cold of mine and help yeah. point me in the right direction. Like, why can't I go to like yeah. a private place? There's this. Like that? There's uh, that's a fund. That's a philosophical fundamental moral question is in that it really boils down to this is that you own your body and you own your mind and that's the bottom line mm -hmm. you should be able to do whatever you want to your body and your mind including making a voluntary you know transaction with somebody who says they're going to treat something that you have now the bad would be from someone lying right from uh from deceit but that's different we're you know that's when you're lying, that's the way. If you if you make a contract, the person lies on the contract. Of the I agreement. feel like 20 years ago that that would be a problem, but now with the way like for, like how we do Yelp, like it just wouldn't exist. Like you fuck up one person, that's to be the last. The medical system already fucks up on enough people, and it's it's regulated. So if it was unregulated and we allowed people to regulate it through reviews and stars, like and I was let's say I was searching something and I had so and there was uh, you know something specific wrong with my ankle, my Achilles, like my Achilles, right? So instead of me having to go through the medical system, what if I could search doctors or people that specialize in Achilles tears? And then I, I can look, read the reviews like, oh my God, this guy was amazing. He helped me do this or this, or it's poor. Oh my God! It made yeah. it work. You know, what I'm saying I'm not gonna go see that guy. You know, what I'm saying or girl. Like, so they just... have rating websites like that now with doctors and stuff like that. Right. I, I mean, really, if you want to, here's the thing: like, if you if you really want to lower the price of of healthcare, you you've got to let it stay out of it completely, and let them compete and let people pay out of pocket. I guarantee you. Uh, you know what's happening right now? And again, this is the market starts to respond in weird ways. There's people who are taking Ubers to the hospital instead of an, a, an ambulance. Yeah, no, I've heard that. You know wow. what I'm saying? Yeah. There's yeah. people literally- That makes well, sense. Well, it's just, like I said, it's um, if they got out of the way and if people had to pay out of pocket, if every time I went to the doctor and I just to ask them a question and I knew it cost me $150, I'm probably not going to go 
when I could figure it out myself most of the time, well, unless it's kind of an emergency. But because insurance covers everything, that's one of the reasons why cost has gone through the roof. There's also no competition where some states have one or two insurance companies. There's the there's lots of middlemen. It's just be, and then you have these in, these these liability insurances that some doctors have to get, like mm-hmm. OB OBGYNs in California, I believe. They can be sued up until the baby turns 18. So if they deliver a child, that child can sue them up until they're they're 18. So now you're an OBGYN and you're paying a quarter million dollars a year or, or you know $150,000 a year just on your insurance to cover yourself. Well, that cost is going to get passed well, down to someone else. Yeah, there's just massive like inefficiencies all the way across the board. Even just like housing people in the hospital for too long just because they need the quota. They need the amount of patients like to to basically pay for all the bills that they have to pay and like just the the business of it in general uh it it just screams inefficiency you guys should see what's going on right now are you familiar with what's going on with like in-home health care right now and no like, oh yeah 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 dude like concierge doctors and once yeah, that becomes more up. yeah like affordable god that's such a better idea it's like you you place all the tools in the hands of the caregivers around you and then they take care of them in their home. Why the fuck you got to go to the, the hospital? Uh, you know, it just, it's just because it's a sterile environment, right? It's, you can create a sterile environment in your house. It's yeah. happening right now. There's yeah. a huge, I mean, it's totally shaken up the healthcare industry with, especially on the physical therapy side. So my buddy who's a PTA and he's been doing it for a long time and, and he's been talking about this transition and, and he finally has made that transition of, you know, instead of these insurance and, and insurance companies are loving it too. That was the big thing was waiting for insurance companies companies to start covering it. It's like okay, you could send these people to this uh, medical facility and get treatment there, and it's costing the insurance company like five hundred dollars a day, or you can pay like an in home care person like one hundred and fifty. You know, and that's way cheaper for the insurance company. And then yeah. the and then the PT who's actually helping the patient, and the service is, is way better. Yeah, it's it's better. They're happier, and it's in their home. It's like a win all the way around. But yet, it was one of those things that took forever to happen. And it's like yeah. now that you see it, watching it disrupt is pretty, pretty crazy to see happen. Yeah, and I think if if it was more, you know, where it was just you had to pay <laughs> yourself, you had to pay out of pocket, you knew what you were paying for, you knew what you were getting. We could rate it off of that because um, most people have no idea how much their procedures cost. Yeah. Most people know they're deductible and that's it. You ask them, you know, hey, you went to the doctor for this. Do you know how much you actually paid? And they'll say, no, they have no idea, which is not a good thing. No. Well, the and person- then the patient's more involved in the process. A, a big, big problem is that, you know, we just, we, we go in and we just trust, like, like, like open trust for like all the way through the entire process without any education going into uh, you know, like the people around, like they're just like at the whim of whatever the doctor says well, versus like, let's be a part of this process together. Well, think about this way too, you know, the doctors and the providers and, you know, the, the nurses and whoever, the ones that do the best job are the ones that you don't have to see a lot. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones that will get better rating and that will actually promote them to to get you better faster versus how long you're in the hospital or how much, how many drugs you can take and all those other things. So, right. yeah. you know, if I go to a doctor and the doctor says to me, take these pills and you'll be better and I got to keep taking the pills and whatever and I'm paying out of pocket and it's costing me less money. Or this doctor says, here's some other options. It's not going to cost you as much and you're going to get better and you're not going to have to buy drugs. And I follow that. I'm going to leave a review and be like, look, you know, I spent way less money with this guy. He showed me a way to do this without taking medications Mm -hmm. and it's working better. And it would just change everything because at the current rate that we're going, there is no way we can sustain it. It's just going to bankruptcy. That's it. Completely. There's no way we can maintain this trajectory it's just too it's absolutely too crazy um and too expensive it will literally bankrupt us 100 oh, percent. i agree you know we have the explosion of autoimmune diseases and and diabetes and then the medical system isn't doing really much to treat those types of things or at least they're just treating the symptoms and uh which is just costing more and more money and who knows what's going to happen with that hey dude i'm really disappointed in neither one of you guys even congratulated me about being on joe rogan yeah, I, know, I, oh, yeah, I feel yeah. like it's a kind of a big deal, and like you uh, got, I beat you guys there, and then you guys don't even say anything. Mind pump, Adam. Too, yeah. you're, it's you're, like, yeah, you're, your your uh, your your video handle. was up. Your video was up on there. Yeah, you yeah. and you and uh, was, our, our girl official. Stephanie. I'm a fi- I'm official. Yeah, yeah Ben Green, Green Ben Greenfield. My boy, Adam. My boy. I told. I sent, I him, I sent him a text <laughs> message. Uh, hey, bro, stop telling people we're friends. I don't even like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, well, now uh, it's solidified to <laughs> millions of people. So that's that's uh, absolutely hilarious. Yeah, that video is it's kind of crazy and random. Okay, that's uh, 
little mind pump uh, prediction and, and foresight on our part, right, to when we saw and found out about Eldoa, all of us were immediately fascinated mm-hmm. uh, with it and thought, man, this is super important that people need to, to hear about this. And that was one of the first videos we did in studio when we first got here. And it's just it was just by chance because Ben Greenfield just happened to be talking about Eldoa yep. as an incredible technique for uh, relieving pressure on your low back. And uh, Joe was like, Eldoa, what's that? How do you spell it? And then they type it in. And our video was the first one. Yeah, populated. because we have the number one video. I think it was at like 30,000 views. So we popped right up. So that was pretty cool to see that. It was, yeah. No, yeah, the, cool. the, uh, Eldo is fascinating. It's basically, it's creating traction. Uh, with this fascia. A, yeah, with fascial lines. So uh, moving your body in positions where the fascia now is creating traction or, or, or you know, traction means you're, you're creating space in between the vertebrae. You're pulling things apart. And I really wish they would explain it that way because every time I ask an Eldoa practitioner what Eldoa is and how it works, I get this. Yeah, it's I get this long like, form answer, like thirty minute yeah. description of something that at the end of it, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, but if you just say like, there's there's fascial lines, and by positioning your body in a certain way, we can create traction through the fascia. Now you're done. Well, really, what you're, well, you're, you're I sold it for you. You're yeah. taking it in your. And I'm, I'm sure I'm simplifying like crazy. But, very much. Yeah, so, but, of course. You know, but that's, that's what that's what's needed. That's what, yeah, exactly. You need, okay, you need nobody. Else, anybody else is going to easy hear introduction and then go into depth. Yeah, that's absolutely. why I think that video is doing so well. Is just because that we did kind of simplify it. You know, we try mm-hmm. to make it as simple as possible for people to understand. Where you're right. Like, I talked to some of the Aldoa guys, and I'm like, "Come on, dude!" But that's academia for it's, you. It's, yeah. Pretty much across the board. It, what is that? Uh, it, is yeah. that something? I, it's something that people, we it's have ego. inside of us that, like, it's an it's more insecurity, right? It's like yeah. this insecurity of like, it, I feel well, you, you want people to know how much you study. It could know, in that direction. It, it could be, but there's this other side to it, and that is that it's it's not easy. You look, I, I've I have. It it's is, not just yeah. small. It's not just really smart people. It's, right. it's most people. If you have someone who, you know how many times I've had people who started a new business or have this idea, and they say, cool, tell me what it is. Yeah. And like an hour and a half later, <laughs> I have no idea what, yeah. you're do- what you're trying to do. They don't know how to put together a simple elevator pitch because- They're they, in it too much. Well, they want to tell you everything. Yeah. They want to tell you the whole thing up, down, left, right, and like break it all down and explain it to you, which only leaves you more confused. This is something I used to teach when, you know, when I would teach people how to sell is you need to be able to summarize what you're trying to say in a 10 second, you know, conversation. Like that and that way they call that the elevator yeah, what's pitch. The sound bite? Yeah, what's the sound bite? It's very difficult for some people to do. We had a friend of ours who had yeah. a fitness product or program and we went I mean it was me and you, right, Justin? Yeah, huh? We went and met and I'm not going to say who it is, I don't want to put him on blast, but we went and met with him and he was trying to break it down, and dude, it, we were there for- There was layers on layers Bro, on layers. we were there for two and a half to three hours, yeah. and at the end of it, I with, finally- With Prezo stuff. I finally looked at him, and I'm like, I still don't know what <laughs> Which, this is. I know. Right. I don't know what you're doing. You have to explain to me what you're doing, because if you can't explain me, your friend, who's super interested in what you're trying to do, and is, right. and, and if I'm excited- He's in the same industry. I'm willing to help you, and I'm in your industry. If you can't explain it to me- no way in hell you'll be able to explain it to the average person. Right. Yeah. So you need to be able to do that, otherwise you're fucked. And it is a skill, you know, at the end of the day. I think it is. Yeah. Hey, I've been getting a lot of messages on, believe it or not, on the Kermit blend, the Organifi Kermit blend. <laughs> you know, the, the green juice mixed with the yellow, so with when, the gold juice. When you start drinking it, is it just like... Hey man, I got I got more Christmas happening. than the Kermit blend. I got more of the Christmas. Christmas blend. is a really good one. Yeah, that's the red and green. That's the most popular I've seen. But I mean, I'm on the I'm on the um, gold kick right now. It's have you been doing it every day? Mm, almost every night. It's like my night thing. You sleep I, better. Uh, I don't know if I would. I can attribute that yet to that. You know me. With what stuff about like your that. what about inflammation? Because you have your ankle. Yeah, but it's not really inflamed anymore. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I'm beyond, I'm beyond like inflammation right now, and I'm not really lifting very consistently. I mean, I'm probably hitting the gym twice a week right now, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not battling a lot of inflammation. I'm all, and I'm also on low low carb uh, right now, so I'm not really seeing a lot of uh, inflammation. So to attribute the gold, you, I wouldn't do that yet. But, but it like, tastes good. It tastes fucking great. It tastes yeah. really good. It's really good. It's the best tasting thing that I think that they made. That so or the far. cacao bliss. I mean, the cacao bliss is pretty awesome. Oh, that's just a yeah. treat. Yeah. That's something that we've done regularly. And it's my little go-to. I just, I put it in my cocoa whip and whip it up with some. So food. this morning I made uh, like a little weight gainer shake. It's not really a weight gainer shake, but I wanted something high calorie. And so I took, and I've done this before. I take 
coconut milk coconut in the fat. can. Yeah. So like the full fat coconut milk. Mm-hmm. And then I put that in a in a blender. So that by itself is 600 something calories. It's meaty. Then I put uh, four egg yolks because I want the cholesterol on top of it. Then I put some of the Organifi protein powder and I did chocolate. And then on top of that, I did Cacao Bliss to throw in more of a chocolatey like flavor. And man, when you blend that up, it's so thick. It's like, it's almost like a batter and it's really fucking good. I want to try it. My client gave me this idea. She, what she's done with it, she said, uh, take the Cacao Bliss. She takes uh, coconut milk, freezes it in <laughs> ice cube trays. And then puts the ice cubes in the shaker cup with the uh, cacao bliss and sh- and shakes it up. And so you got the, the the coconut ice cubes that kind of melts in there. And then she puts dates. So huh. she says dates. She with blends that. it up with dates. No, it's not very even, creative. Even, yeah, doesn't. I don't know if she said blend. I think she just shake, shakes it up. What she, do the dates do? Just float around in there? I don't know. I, don't, I, haven't, got se- I haven't seen it. I don't know. That'd be a weird thing to have in your drink floating around. Yeah. Like a lump. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe she uh, maybe she does a, a magic bullet it or something. But I thought mm. that was uh, interesting. I'm going to try that. By out. By the so. way, you know, before the blender used the name bullet. Do you know what a bullet was? Do you it guys was, remember? Yeah, it was a vibrator. It was a little tiny sex toy. Yeah, it still is. They still sell. Them. They still sell. Them? Yeah, they're called. So magic they marketed bullets. it like you know for your long train I don't, rides. You know, <laughs> I, th- I think I don't think the the like, sex ah. toy company cared when they when the blender came out. Like it was like conflict of interest. Like, uh, I don't think anyone's gonna be shoving any blenders up their vagina. Have you guys soon. ever? <laughs> I don't think this is gonna be a problem. Yeah, have you guys ever been in a in a sex shop? Of course. Yeah, man. With yeah, yeah. When's the last time you've been in a sex shop? Oh my god, probably years ago. But there's one in Santa Cruz. It's like called Frenchies, and uh, it's like it still has that creepiness where you know you don't, everybody's cool, and then there's one guy. You know, and he's there like way too long and he's just kind of perusing like like the massive dildo section. And you're just like, bro. Like, <laughs> you need to calm like, down. <laughs> you need to calm down, man. That guy is into it. I went know? I went into one when I was uh nineteen, I think, to buy That's uh, the last time you went in one? No, no, that's not the last oh, time. Like, Fuck, dude, was- but when I was like nineteen was one of the first times I walked into one and I was gonna get a dirty movie. I was gonna get like some, you know, some porn or whatever. And I remember walking in and it was so uncomfortable to walk in there because I'm, you know, because everybody knows why you're there. There's nothing else that they're selling other than sex stuff and porn. Yeah. So then I'm going through the porn section and part of me wants to take a long time to pick because I'm like this, I'm not going to come back here for <laughs> yeah. a while. Yeah. You're like, I want to make a good decision. Yeah. Man. I'm going to make a really good decision, <laughs> but then you don't want to take too long yeah. because you feel you weird. turn to the guy that's staring at the dildos. So while I'm looking, the girl that works there who also happens to be, I don't know, 24, so I'm 19. She's not that much older than me. She's still young. She comes over and she's like, do you need some help? And I almost died, dude. I'm like, I don't know what to say to this girl. Because yeah. you don't know what kind of help yeah. she's talking about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'll never forget that. So now to this day, if Could I ever walk, steer me this? in the right direction. It's always weird to look at the employees in the store. Batteries? You know, imagine yeah. if you were, you know, you worked in one of those places. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And people no, ask you questions. That's a weird job. You know, hey, how does this, how does this work? Well, this end goes in here. Yeah. This one goes in your partner. I would just assume so, I, th- I would assume somebody who works there is probably kind of a nymphomaniac. That's what I would. You guess. think so? I would guess mm. that. I would think that you really have. What to if be you're a- not a nymphomaniac? Yeah. Then you then all of a sudden you get that stereotype. You know, I bet yeah. you they get. I wonder if they get hit on. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Absolutely. Especially if they're halfway cute. Are you kidding me? Like Justin said, you know how many creeps probably walk there's in that so store? Many. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's got to be a higher rate of creeps that come in there yeah. than just, you know, Jane just, and Joe. Just trench coats Jane and Joe for, for a Friday, what, Friday night. One, one of the stores that you're not angry that they don't have a return policy. Like, that's good. This did work out. Yeah. I was just in there a couple months ago. Oh, wow. Like, all you need yeah. is a dishwasher. I, yeah. I'm, I'm notorious for- You went in there a couple months ago? Yeah, yeah. So I go in every year. So we go in. We it's a this is kind of like a traditional thing that I do. I I like being the guy who 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 puts the sex toy and the white elephant gift for Christmas with the family. Oh, oh yeah. yes, it always gets the family throw somebody <laughs> up because it's like a family event. So there's like board games and some of that, and then out comes this big dildo. Yeah. There's something <laughs> rattling under the tree. Yeah. yeah, it always gets a great laugh out of What'd the family. And then, uh this year, what did I get this year? I can't even think of what I got right now. It wasn't the fuzzy handcuffs. That was the year before. This year was shit, man. 
I don't remember what I got. You know what's funny about that is everybody but laughs, but then at the end of the party, it's like, where'd it go? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Someone took it home. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. That's why it's hilarious to watch because I, I try and get something that's funny or that actually somebody might use, you know, that's good. It's not just something like, <laughs> I don't get like a four foot fucking black dildo that's six, you know, six inches wide. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't do that. Like, I get something. somebody up with that. Thing. I get something that someone's like, Oh, like a card, like one year I did a, uh, they like a sex card game yeah. and then like the sex dice and fuzzy handcuff, all things that somebody in that family or the household would be like, yeah. Oh, I would, I would use those right there. <laughs> yeah. Then you watch them pass it around. Yeah. Oh man. There's some crazy ones out there. Some crazy sex toys out there. Oh yeah. Bring on the bird, dog. Do it. Oh yeah. He's vibrating. <laughs> being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking qua. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. Our first question is from Ricky Rouse One. The benefits of pause reps. Didn't we just answer this? No. No, we didn't. Mm. No, we didn't answer this question. Just a couple, just like less than 10 quads ago. I, I don't we, think so. Yeah, 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 I don't think so. No. You don't remember? Uh-uh. Mm. I don't. Well, just we can the, skip the it. Next question. Qu- no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky's yeah, like, forget fuck. about it. <laughs> so pause reps are when you take a repetition, so you're doing um, you know, squats or a bench press, and you pause the rep within the repetition. So before... You can pause it at the bottom of the rep. It's the most challenging part of the That's rep. the idea, right? Yeah. Or you could pause it at the top of a rep, sure. or you could pause it somewhere in the middle. Now, I love utilizing pause reps because it allows you to focus on a range within the rep that you may have particular trouble with. So yeah. for me, when I first really saw the benefit of pause reps, so this is years ago, I hadn't, I hadn't used this technique um, for most of my lifting career. And then I read the book um, Dinosaur Training, which is this. It's a it's a it's a great kind of old school book on strength training. There's some cool te- some cool stuff in there, and he talks about uh, what he calls bottom position squats. And bottom position squats are when you take a barbell and those you, are really hard to do, by the way. Super hard. Yeah. yeah. You load them on a rack at the bottom of where you and would that's be where you start. at the bottom of your squat, and so you get underneath the bar, you get real tight, and then you lift from the bottom. It's such an eye opener for <clears throat> yeah. uh, understanding CNS because yes. it's amazing that when we start from the top oh, and we it's, decelerate. It's half the Right. What happens is our body, like, it, it forces that CNS to activate, right? You decelerate with something loaded you on get your all back. You that elastic energy everything, potential. By everything coming fire down. is firing because it's like, oh, you know, it's yeah. trying to keep you from getting crushed. Starting at the bottom from a dead stop and going up, it's crazy how loose you feel. How and much how, weaker you are. Yes, yeah. you're weak and, and you're not connected. And what Justin said with the elastic potential is that's the one of the prevailing theories in that you're, when, as you're lowering into a rep, Muscle fibers attach at different points, and what you can what, it, what they start what some of them will do is they'll attach and they'll stretch a little bit, and that elastic potential at the bottom is what gives you more strength. And it's true. Look, I tell you, if you start a squat at the bottom, yeah, you're, catapult you up you're not going to you're not going to be able to lift. You'll you'll lift half as much if not start less. Way light. Way I light, always yeah. recommend someone start way so, light. So I started doing those, and I was like shocked at how weak I was at the bo- starting off that way in a squat. So I'm like, wow, I'm going to start implementing these because anytime I find something like that I know that if I get better at it I'm going to get a huge boost in strength and muscle Mm -hmm. and then part of my training for that was to take a regular squat lower down into the hole where I go down into the squat and then hold it at the bottom for anywhere between three to ten seconds, I would even right. do a ten second. You just hold. want to kill all the momentum. Yeah, I'd stop at the bottom and just stay tight and hold it, and I count one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, however long I was going to do it, and then I'd come back up. And what that did for me was it 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 bumped my squat up more than almost anything anything else that I had right. ever done besides good exercise programming. Right. I'm talking about like little techniques. It was one of the more effective things that I did because it made me so much stronger at the weakest part of my rep, which is at the bottom. Well, it just goes to show you to where you disengage like subconsciously. And uh, a lot of people don't realize like when they actually break 
where they don't have as much tension and they're relying on their joints and everything else to kind of catapult them back and then re-engage and kind of drive out of the position. Whereas how much more effective it is when you're, when you stay tense and when you, 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 you keep everything involved all the way through each point of the lift. So, yeah, I, and then there's a little bit of caution here because uh, I did learn this lesson with uh, the bench press. So then I started applying it to my bench press and, you know, my weakest part of the bench press was at the very bottom. And that's common for a lot of people. It's at the very, very bottom. We tend to be weakest and we tend to be strongest at the very top. So then I started doing a, like every bench was pause. Every bench I'd hold it at my chest. I wouldn't rest it on my chest, but I'd stay tight and I'd hold it for a count of five and then I'd press up and I practice, practice, practice. And it got to the point where I got really strong at the bottom part of my bench, but I lost some of that at the mid range and top. Mm. And the lesson that I learned with this is the strength that you gain from resistance training, a lot of it's very specific. It's what you're emphasizing. Very most. specific. Mm -hmm. So if you practice a pause rep always in the same position, it's, you'll totally get stronger at that position, but you, you need to pay attention because you need to start pausing <coughs> at different portions of the rep. Otherwise you're yeah. going to, now if I were to bench really heavy, I, the, the first four inches off my chest, I'm stronger now than I am after that. After that, I start to get stuck, whereas before it was right at the bottom. And the thing can, same thing can happen with the squat. But when you focus on these different portions of the rep, it is a new stimulus. It is a different adaptation. It's crazy how much like strength is, you know, joint angle specific. Like it, it just, it on all aspects. So it's just like whatever you Whatever you're expressing uh, and, and the most frequently is what you're going to end up being the strongest in. And so you just have to always evaluate that. And it, these gross motor movements are definitely one of those where you want to take your time because the, those deficiencies, you know, you won't really recognize it unless you slow down or you apply things like these pause reps. Mm -hmm. I just like it because it's, it's a great way to teach people like better mechanics. Mm -hmm. When you when you force someone to pause and stop, because I think one of the most common mistakes that I see lifters doing is their tempo and their momentum. Very few people even like I think take it one step back even before you do pause reps. How many people do you think even ch train with a four two two tempo mm -hmm. like that? And that's like the that it four totally. two four two two and hypertrophy is technically the most optimal place to build muscle, right? Which mm -hmm. we've talked about how important phasing and changing out of that. And if you've been doing that for a long time, then it's not. But if you were to take like a six-week study and say, okay, what's most optimal for people to build muscle? It would be a hypertrophy-based repetition range, which is that 10 to 12 rep range. And it would be a tempo that's a 4 2, two which is four-second deceleration, a two-second isolation, pause and hold, and then two seconds on the way up is like the most ideal. But I very rarely ever see somebody working that tempo. No, you know why? It's a fucking ego killer. It's hard as fuck. It's an ego killer. Yeah. Hard as fuck. If you could squat, you know, 10 reps with 315 for in the regular 10 reps um, and you've got decent form, you can pretty much bring that weight down to like 250 to do a 422 for the same amount of right. reps. I mean, it, you, it's a dramatic reduction in the amount of weight you're going to lift and nobody likes that, especially not men, right? We right. don't like we don't like lowering a weight even if if it's to, you know, build more muscle because Oh shit! Somebody could see that. I'm I not train. I train a lot like this, and I always try and teach it to somebody who's lifting with me, or I'm teaching techniques. That man, it's we we get in this we we get in this ego lifting of caring about how much we're pressing up. Mm -hmm. That that's what we're always chasing. Like, oh, my bench went up. Oh, this went up, and it's like, well, look at your tempo too. Try doing. Try taking a hundred pounds yeah, off load that load is not the only measure, right? And see if you can you can decelerate that weight for four seconds mm -hmm. and then hold it at the bottom, then come back up. Right. And it's like if you haven't done it's that, control. if you haven't done that ever, implementing that into your routine is going to show you huge benefits. It's a mind. It's actually huge benefits. It's actually mind blowing. Yes, it's it's very small. And by the way, if you haven't done this. I don't recommend you all of a sudden apply this to every set of every exercise because it's a new intensity and you're going to fry yourself. Do it like pick a few exercises that are real important Some to you. Some staple ones, squat or bench press. Yep. Those two alone are and, great for this. And apply it and then watch how you progress and you'll find that within that pause, you're going to get much, much stronger and start playing with it because it's a really effective. It's actually one of my favorite techniques. It also doesn't require complicated equipment. It doesn't require chains or bands. It doesn't require changing the exercise even. I right. could take the same exercise and just pause the repetitions and get some, you know, some benefit of it. One of the other ways that I learned how to use pause reps was relatively recently when we started Mind Pump, 
I had, you know, when I had done overhead presses, um, I had developed the habit of kind of the pumping rep where you press it up and then drop it right back down. So I never really lock completely out and hold it at the top. Oh, and that's that. the bodybuilding way of doing, you know, a shoulder press because you're now you're keeping constant tempo. You want to get a pump, blah, 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 blah. And what ended up happening was that became the pattern that I became good at. And uh, I was bad at locking out and holding a weight above my head. I didn't realize how bad it was until we started working together. Justin started making a big deal about overhead carries where you, like especially with the kettlebell, where you straighten your arm out above your head, mm -hmm. hold it, and then walk or just hold it for time. So I went home and, you know, or I went to the gym and I practiced it. And I was so blown away at how difficult it was. Like, here's a way I can press this weight eight times above my head in that pumping fashion. But if I have to lock it out and hold it, all of a sudden I'm shaking and this is really terrible. So I started implementing them. I started implementing holds and my shoulders grew and my overall strength mm -hmm. grew. And, it, you know, just again, another testament to the range of your reps and how the tempo of your reps make a huge difference in the strength adaptation you're going to get, which then can make a big difference in how much muscle you build in the, in the type of results that you start to get. And you want that. You want strength in all these different ranges of motion because it's going to make you more stable, more functional. And when you work out in larger ranges of motion, you're more likely to stimulate more muscle fibers and get better results. Next question is from Raising Autism. When training, why does everything feel super heavy on some days and other days weight feels good? Is it tied to recovery or to other factors? Could be both. Could yeah. be recovery Nervous and system. could be other factors. Could be, yeah, CNS for sure would be the first thing you look at. Could be nutrition too. I mean, mm -hmm. you could be, uh, it could be a lot of things. Fuck, that's a tough one. Yeah. The state of mind. State of mind too. Um, you could literally be feeling really good, about to work out have a stressful email or conversation with someone or start to feel down about yourself. And that too will start to affect your strength uh, because your thoughts affect your central nervous system and how it fires. Obvi 100%, this is not a debate. Um, if you were to think about something very stressful, you would get into a, you know, a sympathetic state, which is your, is, is your central nervous system creating this fight or flight response, um, which can become fatiguing if you're in that for too long. In the short term, it can make you stronger. Um, and, uh, so that has a big effect on how strong you are. A great example of that is if you give someone caffeine right before they work out and their strength goes up, well, what the caffeine did is it amped up the CNS. It didn't make you build, you build any more muscle in the short period of time that the caffeine, you know, took its time to, to give you that effect, but your CNS did respond and it did. Uh, make you stronger. Then there's the obvious ones, obviously, right? If you didn't get good sleep, if your diet is off and those kinds of things. But when this person is talking about from one day to the next, I'm assuming that they're talking about like they, they that everything was the same. Like, I don't get it. Like, you know, my diet was the same. Mm -hmm. I had the same sleep, but today I'm really weak or today I feel shaky or I don't feel as whatever. And the nutri everything else was the same. I just don't get it. Now, one thing you can do is you can start to take this in your own hands and start to modify and control it a little bit. And this is kind of the science behind priming. Mm -hmm. When you prime your body for your lifts, part of what you're doing is you're getting yourself to a position or where your muscles fire more efficiently, which is going to give you more strength. This is 100% true. This is why when you go lift cold, you're not able to push as hard as if you do a, a, a warm up. Even if the warm up is terrible, a warm up is terrible is usually better than no warm up at all because you can get under the bar and fire um, and feel secure in how you far fire. Part of this is your body has these natural protection mechanisms that are in place to prevent you from injuring yourself. So uh, at any given moment, an untrained individual, if they were to exert maximum strength, really is only exerting a percentage of their actual potential. Mm -hmm. So when someone goes to lift something off the floor and they're a total beginner, and I'm making up some arbitrary numbers, but I believe I'm close to what they are, they're probably really summoning something like 50% of their actual strength potential because their body's got these governors. And the governors say, we're only going to let you access this much strength because any more than that is potentially dangerous where you're right. either going to tear something or hurt something. Now, trained trainees or people with experience 
especially people who train specifically in this, like, like Olympic power, lifters yeah, power lifter or power lifters, have the ability to summon something like 70 to 90% mm-hmm. of their actual potential because they've trained their body to be able to summon more strength and to be able to let off the governors a little bit because they've proven that they're a little bit that they have that they're safe within them. Mm-hmm. Part of that comes from stability, part of it comes from practice. I think the central nervous system learns over time that it can exert more power. Now, you can influence this in the very short term. If you do a good priming session before a lift, you are going to be able to summon more strength by being more stable and by kind of telling the CNS, you know, hey, I, you know, I think I can I think we can do this a little more safely. Yeah. It's interesting because it's one of the most overlooked over the years uh, ways of training the body that has the most immediate impact. And you see this now with like FRC, which we're actually hosting uh, a certification here, which is great. What their whole process is, is really to um, address the fact that we haven't trained our CNS to now um, override that system. Like you're talking about the governing system. We all have these governing uh, systems in place to to protect us, to keep us from overextending ourselves, to to get in ranges of motion that are problematic. And, um, you know, the, their whole system derives around unlocking that and unlocking your more potential because, you know, it, in a sense, it's just that you haven't trained your body to get comfortable in certain ranges and certain positions and to really connect to that process to where you get your muscles to fire efficiently and you do all that through accessing your nervous system. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, nervous system plays such a critical role in strength that uh, is completely overlooked. And I, I Would, feel like, yeah, you're, like powerlifting is probably the best example of like the ultimate expression of that. It's crazy to me that more people don't own that program of ours because it's one of the ones that it doesn't you don't even have to be following a maps program you can be following any program you want and you add maps prime to your routine and i guarantee that you will see something from that immediately like right away your first, first it's, workout it's, it's not one of those things you get away like oh you go through the whole program to see if this program really works it's like it's like does caffeine work right Boom. Yeah, it it's works. like yeah, guaranteed if you take the test you figure out kind of where your imbalances are where where your needs are you apply it to just your do routine. the pre-primer yes <laughs> re- ap- apply it to your routine it will fucking blow your mind. And if it doesn't, you have fucking 30 days money back guarantee. Yeah. Like, how are you, how do you not, how does not everybody own Prime? Because, and for us, it was for sure, if you were to ask any of us what we think is the most revolutionary program that, that we created, it's that one. That one. It's 100% that and, one. And that. The, the reason why it's, the, is because we've placed so much emphasis on the muscles and on diet and supplementation yeah. that, we have left out CNS. Okay, so <laughs> if you were to list, this is no joke. If you were to list the things that impacted your performance uh, of your body and muscle growth, number one would be your CNS. It would, that would be the most important. It's literally that big of a deal. I'll, I'll give you a simple test you could do right now while you're listening to this podcast. Here's an easy one. If you have, uh, if you have something that measures grip strength, great. If you don't, you can kind of tell without needing to measure it, but Squeeze something as hard as you can, or just grip your left hand as hard as you could. You can squeeze it as hard as you can, but relax your entire body. So all you're squeezing is your left hand, and squeeze it as hard as you can, but do not tense up any other muscles in your body. Then give yourself a minute or two to rest. Repeat that, but this time tense up the entire body, including your face. Use your whole body. Yeah. What you'll find oh, is- you'll feel how much grip, much more grip- You're radiating at that point. What you'll find, if you could measure your, your grip strength, is that you're stronger, significantly stronger, in squeezing your grip when the whole body is priming, when your whole body is tensing. Now, that's a simple example, and that's not how you prime your workouts necessarily, but that's just highlighting how- if you understand how the central nervous system works or, or the Right, you're not place, changing the movement. You're still squeezing your hand the same way. The only difference is you're calling upon your entire that's, that's body. force production. Right, versus just those it, muscles. It's such an esoteric idea for people. I don't understand like, why. Because we've, we've not talked about it for yeah, so long. It's, it's, it's not sexy. It's But it's crazy to me because like everybody can understand that to, to provide movement, like I have to like accomplish this thing right here. How does that process even start? Mm-hmm. You have to like... You have to neurologically focus and and direct 
uh, you know, your body in that, in that process. And like, and, and then I have to ramp that up. If I need more force, I have to really ramp up my nervous system to be able to produce that force output. That's mm-hmm. going to accomplish, you know, that task. And it's just like, uh, people don't understand that. Right. So if you go to the gym and you know, even if you don't, even if you didn't have good sleep and you didn't have a good diet, but you're going there and you're like, man, I feel kind of weak or whatever, but I want to perform. I want to get the most out of this workout. Um, and you're, you know, it's a, you know, it's a good workout. So you don't think you have to rest or whatever, then learn how to get your CNS to amplify and turn on in the way that you want it to. And you will get much more out of your workout. Now, if you go into your workout and you're feeling good and you throw this on top of it, you're going to feel a lot better. I I mean, we've trained clients for so long. I would get a client. It's very simple. I get a client. I'd have them do a squat. I'd see an, an, something's going on. i do a couple priming movements. we get into the squat. Boom. Form changes. Everybody feels better. All of us. Here's another example. I don't know how many guys have, have experienced this. Do you remember when those stupid bracelets the baseball players were wearing? They were in style. Yeah, they were the, copper. To, magnet. the copper. Yeah, right? or the magnet or something. Uh, it, was, it was dumb, right? It was hocus pocus bullshit. But they were selling knockoffs and stuff in the malls and I'll never forget I went into the mall and there was this dude that was selling these bracelets oh, the trick yes yes and yes. what he what he did was he said okay here's the test I want you to stand on one foot and put your arm out you know put your arm length uh, your arm straight out to your side hold it as strong as you can I'm going to try and knock you over by pushing on your hand and the first time he does it you lose your balance and you're like whoa okay then he says put this bracelet on he puts it on you real quick and he goes try again and the second time he does it it's harder to push you over. Yeah. Now, to the average person, you're just like, holy fuck, the bracelet Whoa. works. No, <laughs> no. On. That is central nervous system adaptation. The Pattern first, recognition. That's it. The first time was practice. The right. second time. It was so foreign to you. How often do you stand on one leg, put your arm out, and have someone push on you? That, Never. And you're tensing. That's you know? a, a, Another example is when I have a client who's a beginner, and I would teach them how to do a single leg toe touch, which requires you to balance on one foot. And then reach down and touch your toes and come back up without touching the floor with your other foot. The first set is the worst. The second and third set, they start to get a lot better until they start to fatigue and then it gets worse again. Mm-hmm. But before things start to fatigue, and I'll, I love doing this because it's fucking magic. I'll, I'll, I'll tell the client, this is great for you personal trainers, by the way, that you can just blow your clients away. You can literally tell them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate to you how central nervous system adaptation works and why this is going to be a focus of ours. When we train together, it's very important that we understand how the central nervous system works and how to train it properly to get you the results that you're looking for. Let me give you an example. Have them do a single leg toe touch. Have them do one set. It's going to be real fucking hard. And then tell them the second and third set, you're going to get successively better. And nine out of 10 times that will happen. They'll get blown away. And now you've got your example of how the CNS adapts. There you go. Parlor tricks. Next question is from Healthy, Happy, and Free. How do you break a bad habit? (sighs) That's a tough one, man. Depends- Do you guys have any bad habits you've broken? It, yeah, I've broken a lot. You look of bad in the habits. mirror and you say no. It just really depends on the habit. So one, one right now, currently for me, I just I haven't had a Coke Zero or a Diet Coke in uh, I don't know how long now. I think I'm on twelve three, hours at least, three or four weeks. <laughs> <Just> yeah, <kidding. laughs> three or four. That's true. I haven't seen you have one at all. No, of course you. I haven't. I have it. So. Uh, and what led up to that is, you know, and at one point I have these things with, I've talked about it before, everything from cannabis to diet Cokes to, um, anything that I know is not optimal for my body, caffeine, anything that I know is not uh, optimal for my body. And I start to uh, find myself ramping up. I give myself a little latitude. I'm not fucking a stickler where I freak out like, Oh my God, that's so bad for my body. Having a diet Coke. You know, every once in a while, it's when I catch myself starting to have one every day. And then when I even start catching myself having two in a day, it's like, okay, now it's time to stop buying. And the first step for me is to stop buying them. So like I have them in my house. If they're in my house, it's really hard to not go have one with dinner or with something that I'm eating. So for a habit like that, I I don't go cold turkey. I, I know people, the other people that think it's easier or had more success that way. Um, 
I I tend to like to just kind of scale it back because then it doesn't feel like I'm really depriving myself. Like I'm I went from having a diet coke every single day and sometimes two in a day to none whatsoever. I go from the guy who was having it every single day and having it in his home to not having it in my home, but then maybe when we go out and we go to this Mexican restaurant, I decide I want a Coke with that, or we have a pizza on Friday, and so I decide I want a Coke with that. Did you find yourself when you would have, because I, I feel like there may be a distinction between a behavior and a habit, although I'm not quite sure how to make that distinction. I'm trying to, as you're talking, I'm trying to think to myself if there is, in fact, like, a, like if it, like, is it, I, I, when I think of a habit, I think of something that you're, like instinctually just doing like I just do this and I don't even think about it was was mm. was your coke was you know was that becoming that way where you yeah just- and that's what I that's what I mean is like when it when it comes in when it turns into something that be- is starting to become a habit right like that's you don't when, even think about it you right just grab just, it. I start grabbing it. and the the sign for me that it's becoming a habit is when I've gone and grabbed like two in a day like that's the that's kind of the light bulb that goes off for me that it's like okay now this is becoming such a habit that I just go when I go to get something to drink it's to go to the refrigerator grab the diet coke and I could see where this is leading and the same thing goes for caffeine like if I catch myself you know going for a, a coffee or a caffeine drink every single time I feel a little dip in energy or I feel I need a, a pick me up and that becomes my go to and next thing you know I'm going from one a day every day to two or three in a day that's my my mm-hmm. kind of you know, light bulb that goes off and says, Hey, Adam, it's time to back off of these things. And the same thing with cannabis when I'm doing cannabis and it becomes an every single night thing. And then it becomes a thing where I've got to smoke a whole joint for me to even get the same effects that I would get from just taking two puffs before. That's kind of my indicator that it's time to back off of that also. So Mm -hmm. I kind of have these, these parameters that I put on myself um, that help me stay ahead of like it becoming a really bad habit where you know, you're doing it for a long period of time, but uh, you know, that's, I think everybody is going to be different. I know other people that have uh, better success with just cutting cold Turkey and going that, but then I feel like I'm depriving myself where this feels like I'm starting to do something for my body. I know that's not ideal. And so I'm going to mitigate it. I'm going to limit it a little bit. And so I don't feel like, again, and I might have a diet Coke sometime this week. So it's not like I'm saying I'm done with diet Coke. I'm never going back in. It's like, Hey, I was starting, to, it was starting to become a habit. I don't want it to be a habit. I want it to be something that, hey, every once in a while when I'm craving something like that or whatever, I hate using that term, but something that I feel like having, I'm going to have it. And then I don't feel bad about it because I've been doing it the, like crazy. The, the feeling of deprivation, this is an interesting one now. I had this conversation a long time ago and it really blew my mind. I used to train a uh, psychologist and we would talk about the psychology behind the reason why people eat uh, the way they do because- it's, you know, it's obviously a tough subject when you're a trainer or you're working in fitness. The workouts actually are the easy part. It's the nutrition is always the oh, hard God, part. Yeah, it's the re- religion part. Yeah. And, and we talked about this whole, I feel deprived. And you actually mentioned that a couple of times. And she said to me, you deprivation comes from being forced right. to do something. So if you change the mindset around because mm-hmm. you know if i stop something if i'm eating cake every day which is a silly example but let's say i'm eating cake every day and then i stop eating the cake and then i'm like man i feel like i'm being deprived i'm not because it's me that's deciding to not have the cake if if it was someone else that was forcing me and locking me up in a room and saying no you can't have any cake that's what we, that's where the deprivation feeling comes from but if it's a voluntary choice I'm not depriving myself. And some people think that this is, you know, semantics, that it doesn't make that big of a difference. No, it makes a fucking huge no, it difference. Makes a big difference for me. The words that you use to describe the things that you do and the way you talk to yourself are feedback. You you listen to your own words. So if I say to myself, I can't have cake, then it's gonna feel like I'm forced. Like, why can't I have it? Like I can, but someone says I can't, right, and now right. I can't. Versus I don't want to, or I'm choosing not to. Now, Mm -hmm. some people have a problem with that because they'll think to themselves and say, well, I do want to. No, you don't. The reality is you don't want to because you're choosing not to. If you want it, then you choose to have it. And so you have to change that mentality where I understand the thing. You're in the driver's seat. Yeah, I understand the allure of having that piece of cake and I acknowledge it like, yes, I like the taste. I like... You know the, the the texture. I like the way it smells. I enjoy it while I'm eating it. Um, so I know those things, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a you know admitting those things to myself. I'm acknowledging those things. I'm honoring those things. 
but I don't want to have that cake and I'm choosing not to have that cake, and which is true. As much as you is there's a battle within you to where one side of you understands the benefits, the good things you like about it, there's another side of you that also understands the bad sides of it. And what you're doing is you're just making a choice and say that to yourself because when you feel empowered by that choice, it doesn't feel because when you feel deprived at some point, you're going to give in. That's a shitty feeling to feel. Like if you well, keep feeling I think, that. Yeah. And I think most bad habits, like we, we feel like they happen, you know, like, like this is something that's like keeps happening to me as opposed to, you know, recognizing that I have control and, and that I, I'm consciously making this decision. And, you know, for me, it's been the phone and the phone is, oh, is, yeah. has been my nemesis because, I keep getting in positions where I'm fixated on it on the couch while chaos is happening all around me. (laughs) And I'm just, and then I I recognize, I'm like, wow, how did I, and then like there's 20 minutes have gone by and I'm just staring at this fucking thing. And so I I have had to reframe that. I've had to uh, recognize like I'm, I am consciously going to that place amidst chaos. Like I am, that is where I'm turning. As opposed to when I'm coming home, I'm deliberately now consciously taking my phone, jacking it into the charger, and then I'm hands free. And then if I have to check it, I have to check it over where the charger is. So, so it's, you have to get up. You have I to- have to. Yeah, I have to. Like, there's a lot more steps involved now to get you know back to that kind of place. But yeah, it's. I used to just justify it with work, justify it with. Um, you know, people need to get a hold of me, whatever the fuck it was. It, it, it was always something that was, uh, outside of my handle. Whereas that's, that's stupid. That's, that's, that's my own fault. This is what happens with, uh, bad habits, by the way, is that, and this is a cycle that you can, you can try to recognize in yourself. I recognize it myself and it's very tough because, you know, your ego or whatever you want to call it doesn't fucking like it when, someone else points it out or when you even identify it in yourself because what happens is you'll have a bad habit or a habit that you want to change. It's not even called bad, just something you want to change. And when, like like what Justin was saying, like what you were saying about the phone, you will then, rather than admit to yourself that this is a cycle, that this is a habit, that this is something you want to change because that's painful. Change is always difficult, right? Changing a pattern, any pattern, it's difficult. Think about it this way. It's like, imagine walking to, you know, you're a kid and you walk to school every single day, the same path. And then the next day someone says, no, you got to take a different way to get to school. It's going to take a second to get used to that new way. There's a lot of unknowns there. You know, uh, the unknown is always difficult. You know, a pattern develops into a pattern because it's known, it's predictable. We know what's going to happen and we're surrounded by in a world of uncertainty. So it just, it just makes us feel calm. That was your best analogy you could come uh, with? Uh, what do you mean? Walking to school? Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it could be anything. <laughs> it could be anything that you do a lot of. So what happens is, you know, when you're in this, in this process of, of identifying what's going on, um, you have to break that cycle. You have to stop it or interrupt it and realize that what will happen is you will justify it before you'll try to break it. So if someone says mm-hmm. to me, Hey man, you're on your phone too much. My instinct is going to be to protect Defensive. that. Yeah, it's going to be to protect that safe feeling, um, you know, ritual because it feels safe, right? There's chaos, like you said, there's chaos all around you. I'm on my phone. I'm, it's predictable. I don't have to deal with, you know, or think about or feel mm-hmm. what's going on around me. So when someone says to me, "Hey man, you're on your phone," I'm going to want to say, "Yeah, but I work and most of my business." And it's, you're automatically going to, going to want to defend it. What you have to consider is you're constantly making. There's constant bargaining going on within yourself. It's it, the bargaining is between you now and you in the future. This is what you're bargaining with, and sometimes what you do now takes from you in the future, and sometimes taking from you now gives you in the future. So here's a good example: if I have a thousand dollars of expendable income, I can spend that thousand dollars on a weekend in, let's say, you know, a weekend at a nice restaurant, going out, getting drinks and just really extravagant time, which is paying me now. Cause in the moment I'm having a good time, I'm enjoying myself, but it's taking that thousand dollars away from me in the future. Or I can say to myself, I also want to get that, you know, that, that car, I need to get a new car. My car might be breaking down here pretty soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bargain with me now. And I'm going to say to myself, you know what, you're not going to enjoy yourself right now, but you're going to trade this for something in the future. 
And so that's another process you can use with the bad habit. What am I trading this habit with? The- I liked what you originally said because I, th- I think it's a lot like, you know, we talk about, you know, work out be- not because you don't like yourself, but work out because you love yourself, right? I think the same thing goes for the bad habits. It, I don't look at it like you said earlier, I can't have this or I'm depriving myself of this. Absolutely, I can. I'm a fucking grown ass man. I can do whatever I want, you know, like, and I will have a soda again. I will do some of these things again. But I also want to do that in moderation. I think that I'm not doing the best for my body and I want I want to feel healthy and I want to feel good and I want to make sure that I'm fueling it properly. And I know that when I'm doing these some of these bad habits, I'm not optimizing that. I know I'm not. And so that's for me, it's like getting back to that because I'm not serving myself. And so it's still a bargain though, right? Because you're bargaining like I think the just, taste of the it's, soda it's, now it's versus more, it's more of a mind it's just more of a mind shift. It's more of a in, instead of this being a negative negative thing it's more of a positive thing i'm i'm excited to do that because what i what i'm looking at is you know i want to see how much if i notice i feel better i've noticed my digestion if i'm not doing these nasty burps all of a sudden and i notice that i feel more hydrated I, if i start to, start to notice maybe a difference in energy like i i'm looking for the the benefits that getting rid of this bad habit is going to is mm-hmm. and i'm trying to connect those dots to that which is going to make me want to refrain from this thing again it's not to say that i still won't indulge or enjoy it again one time but if i can learn to connect the dots to the positive benefits of eliminating this bad habit habit, then I, I'm more likely to stick with it being out of my life and be motivated to not want to reintroduce it. You know what's it. cool about habits? Because I, I, when, again, when I think of a habit, I think of something that becomes a cycle, this unaware cycle that I just do, 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 and I'm not necessarily aware I'm doing it. You know what's cool about this is because we're in fitness, I can connect this to a bad recruitment pattern uh, when you're working out. So when you think of uh, if you're mo- if you're squatting a particular way and that's how you've always squatted and it's not the ideal way for your joints in order to change that recruitment pattern because that pattern has become your default pattern. And that's what I think a habit is. It's almost like your default pattern. In order to change that default pattern, there's a few things you need to do. And one of them is to replace it with something else and practice the fuck out of it. It's almost like you have to break a cycle with a new cycle so you can get out of it and then you can look back and be like, you know, what's going on? So uh, identifying triggers is a big one. If you know you always smoke when you take a break and you go outside, then maybe you take a break and you don't go outside. Not to say you should never go outside, but just to kind of break that cycle. Or maybe you know that when you're stressed out, you tend to you know, bite your fingernails. So what you do now is you say to yourself, when I'm stressed out, I am going to- Breathe. Yeah, do this other thing. Yeah, whatever it is. Do this other thing, and I'm going to replace this new, this recruitment pattern, for example- Why is biting with your a nails new- such a bad thing? I've always wondered that one. Yeah. Um, Why well, is that a bad thing? I think it's just because it doesn't look good, and you're always well, putting your hands stupid, in your mouth. That's, that's a stupid. <laughs> all both of those are stupid reasons. I right? think it could. I mean, we probably evolved using our teeth to fucking probably keep our fucking fingernails clean most of our lives. Maybe yeah, people just I think mean, it's a nasty. It's habit. only been probably in the last hundred to two hundred years did we get tools to actually do Dude, that. I, so why is why it so, is picking your boogers I'm not, and I'm in not, public? Right. Gross. Yeah. I'm not justifying that. That I just I know that's one that people commonly say like, oh, nail biting is such a bad habit, but is it really? Dude, is so that really, that's something really that people just think it's gross. Gross. That's right, all. Right. That's yeah. something that I've always struggled with since I was a young kid. And then I read. What about the cracking of, na- of, of yeah, knuckles? That's, that's, that's not I, good. I read this. Uh, I wasn't reading an, a book. I think it was an encyclopedia. And <laughs> they were showing. Um, I don't remember the name of the type of wart, but warts inside the mouth. And there was a picture. Because if you ever look at like medical things in, in encyclopedias, they always show you the picture of the worst case scenario. <laughs> and there was this fucking picture of this dude opening his mouth and his mouth hat was just covered in clusters of of warts and they were talking about how Mm. this particular condition some people need surgery to remove them and then underneath it it talked about risk factors and one of them was people who bite their nails because they pick up the virus on their hands (laughs) scared the fuck out of me and after after that i've always made holy shit i know right Uh, after that uh, i remember reading that i was like oh shit and I Stupid. became more conscious of not doing that anymore. <laughs> Wart mouth. Next question is Taylor Rianne. What are your thoughts on the best personality type for those in the fitness industry? Do you have advice on getting into personal training if you have a more reserved personality? Do the necessary people skills just come with time and experience or are there techniques and habits one could implement in order to be more relatable and approachable hmm. for clients? That's a big question. 
That's a really good question. I, uh, if you are, if you have, um, extrovert qualities about you if you like to go up to people and talk to them and start up a conversation it'll be easier it'll yeah it'll make being a personal trainer exponentially easier does that guarantee you're going to be successful nope no nope. it just makes it easier because part of your job is going to be going and getting you know new clients when you first start now that being said i've had several trainers and fitness professionals work for me who were not good at that so that was the part of the job that they weren't good at but on the flip side, they were so good at training their clients, developing relationships with their clients, being consistent with their clients, uh, you know, where their clients trusted them to where they didn't have to go out and prospect as much because when they got clients, they kept them mm -hmm. for a very, very, very long time. So I think it's just one factor. It makes things easier, but at the end of the day, it's only one of many factors. It's one, it's one of the top five. You know, if you were to say like the top five, you know, factors that make a good personal trainer it for sure is top five but just like you're saying i've had many i mean uh, justin's an example of this justin wasn't mr fucking you know loud outgoing personality and talking to people all over the place like he was a, a quiet more reserved trainer but he excelled on the the training part like way beyond most of the average trainers right so i think if you're not going to have that then you probably need to separate yourself somewhere else right mm -hmm. so if that's somewhere you really lack then you you want to be on your you better be one of the smarter trainers when it comes to nutrition one of the smarter trainers when it comes to biomechanics and you have you do really good maybe one on one privately where you're just talking to that one person uh, I think you, that needs to happen because then you have an, I'm an example of the opposite right I was a terrible trainer uh, my first probably five years as a personal trainer and I know that's me being a little hard on myself but it's being true I I, I think that I had a lot of personality clients people naturally liked me as a person therefore it was easier for me to get clients and train people but as far as my programming my my level of education and nutrition it was very minimal back then mm -hmm. and so i i what i was good at was i was good at taking a little bit of information that i had learned i also knew too that if i was a trainer and they were buying training from me i probably knew more than them. Like even if it was only a little bit more, I knew a little bit more. And so I stuck to what I knew a little bit more than everybody, than the people that were hiring me. And I was really good at sharing that information. I was really good at giving you the little bit of information that I've learned. I had learned at that point at 20 something years old and providing that to people. But I wasn't an expert by any means. There was lots of other trainers that were way smarter than I was. Now over time, the education and experience, then that all developed, you know, after we've gotten a bunch of certifications and have been training for 10 plus years and thousands of clients. Well, now I've formed into being a really good trainer when it comes to nutrition and mechanics. And then I'm still that personable person. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you definitely nailed the fact that that was something that I had to develop, you know, and that was, I can identify with this on some level. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself a super introvert, you know, going into, especially in a one-on-one -on -one setting. I think it's more for me, the intimidation was the unknown and uh, getting into a group setting where I had to kind of lead and, and, and then uh, communicate to everybody. That was always something that I really struggled with. But um, this, is, this is something that you can develop. And if, if you're a growth minded person, you can work on this and you can get better at it. And it's not like these definitions that we put in place of who we are and our identity is not fixed. And that, that is something that, you know, you, you definitely have the power to uh, get outside of that and, and, and become, become something else like, be, like own it more as a strength. And whether it's, whether it's like the ultimate strength that, that people can identify with, you know, is that's like one of the characteristics that stands out about you. Maybe not, but at the same time, it's not a weakness anymore. Right. How did you do it? What did you do? <clears throat> How did you work on this part? To well, because I know in the environment that we all worked in, yeah, that was a it was a clusterfuck. It was a big, busy gym, and that was and competitive with other trainers. It was competitive. It was very fast paced. It was like a, sort of sink or swim. And um, me, like even before that, I had some bit of effort in that direction. Um, like having responsibility, being a leader on, you know, a, a position in the football team. I used to be able to just handle myself, handle everything that I did. I would do perfectly by myself, no accountability. Mm -hmm. People just know I would get it done. And then it became now I have to lead other people and instruct. 
And so that became a challenge for me and I had to evolve and I had to, you know, sharpen those skills. And then getting into jobs, I started pursuing more jobs where it was a so, it was in more in a social setting, like, you know, waiting tables, like becoming a bartender. Like I had to like honestly work on my my small talk. And that seems so ridiculous, but it is definitely something that I benefited from. Uh, just being able to come up and conjure up a conversation uh, where I felt like, God, this is such a dumb conversation, but at the same time, I need to ease people into uh, this environment. And so taking that and then starting to try to really refine that and, and build that comfortable uh, dialogue with people immediately, it took a lot of fucking reps. And and also just kind of forcing yourself. Yeah, just immersing myself and and then going onto the floor and introducing myself uh you know as somebody that works there and staff and then just trying to be more relatable and and understand uh you know the the potential like the members there. Like mm-hmm. I want I wanted to understand where they're coming from like um you know get to know them and I mean that was hard, man. Like yeah. I, I like I didn't care. Like <laughs> I just cared about what I was doing and so I had to just get outside of that. So it's Literally, it's reps. It's reps, 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 and it's it's starting to to sort of eliminate all these these restrictions that you yourself are putting in front of you. Like you're telling yourself that you're not good at that. Fuck that. Be better at it, mm-hmm. and just just completely tackle it with a different mindset. I so it's funny <clears throat> for me with this particular type of question. Uh, in the gym, um, I'm extreme extrovert i'm super talk to everybody make it happen i'll get on the i'll get on the intercom i'll make it i'll stand on the front desk make an announcement to the whole gym no problem but i'm not actually an uh, an extrovert i'm i'm kind of both and it depends on the environment like you put me in a different environment and i'll have a tough time just going up and just talking to random people once i start it's not a problem but i'm not super extroverted but it's funny, the gym environment I was, as soon as I was in the gym and as soon as I had on the shirt that showed that I worked at this place, because I felt that sense of authority, like, okay, now I work here and this is what I'm supposed to do, then I, and it was the fear. All it was was the fear was gone. Now I can talk to anybody and have a great time about it. And it was mm-hmm. like a complete, like I was a completely different person. Probably <clears throat> one of the reasons why I fell in love with it is because working in gyms, brought the best out of me in that regard. In that particular regard, that was the absolute best. If only I had those skills, you know, at a party talking to girls and stuff. And I wasn't super introverted there either, but I wasn't like I was in the gym. Like in the gym, I was a superstar from day one is because I felt like it was my space and I could just, you know, talk to anybody and have a great time. And I was getting, I had 30 clients before I was certified. They put me in there as as a tra- as a trainer to learn from other trainers for... Uh, I had two weeks. They gave me two weeks until the certification class came up. And so they said, you know what? You could start and then for the next two weeks, you could do these orientations with other trainers. And I got myself 30 clients and all of them waited for me to get certified. And it was 100% because I was fearless and I just talked to people. One of the hardest things about talking to people in general, um, but even, especially in the gym, is that initial part of the conversation, the break. Like, how do I start the conversation? Mm-hmm. Once a conversation gets going, it's a lot easier for most people. So here's an easy tip, super, super easy tip. One of the easiest things you could do is park yourself at the front desk. When people walk in, you scan their card, introduce yourself. It's an easy way to start the conversation rather than walking in on somebody doing a workout who's already kind of in their space. That feels so much more forced uh, and so much more difficult. The second thing that I would recommend is for you to give something away, whether it's free sessions or t-shirts or advice or free guest passes, make an announcement on the intercom, then people come to you and now you don't have to break that conversation. And the third tip I can give you is this. One of the easiest ways you could break into a conversation is to compliment someone or comment on something that you see either in the gym or that they're wearing. So like when I was out in public, one of my favorite ways to talk to people about personal training or the gym was I would go up to a random stranger and I'd be like, hey, where do you work out at? And it was, people are kind of like, huh? They take it as a compliment because they assume I think they work out. And uh, people will always answer and they'll either say, oh, I work out at this gym or, 
oh, I don't work out. And then that opens up the conversation and it's way, way easier. I think it's also worth considering that maybe fitness isn't for you. And I know that 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 stings for somebody asking a question like this, but I also wouldn't recommend somebody who doesn't like cars to be a mechanic. Mm-hmm. And if you're not a, a people person and really into that, then you really got to have this deep passion for the mechanics and the nutrition piece. Like I, I just, to me, it's a top five quality in a person and that you need to have to be a successful personal trainer. And, you know, if you're not really passionate about people and conversing and doing that, it's not to say you can't be successful. Justin gave great examples of, you know, but he's very pr- passionate about sports performance and mechanics and training. And yeah, I mean, and he's just passionate about helping people. And I think that that's, that's the underlying thing that people read, right? Like right. how, how, how passionate are you about helping me? Right. And I think that, so this, this to me is something that you have to evaluate that like there's no reason to force yourself into an industry that you potentially are not going to love all the aspects of it, especially one of the major aspects, which is communicating with others. There's a lot of things that you can do within fitness that's not personal training too. You know, you don't have to go that route. You could do other other aspects of the business and maybe leaning more towards one of your strengths. So, because I've let go of a lot of trainers too that try to force this issue. Mm-hmm. Very, very common to get somebody who's fresh out of school from Kines and I meet them and they've got the education and they understand things, but then they don't have a really good ability to to give that information to the people. They've got all this great stored knowledge in their brain and then ask them to communicate that to a client who probably doesn't give two mm-hmm. shits how smart they are. And they, they struggle with it and they struggle a lot with it. And so if you're somebody who struggles with that, it it may may not be the career for you. I hate to say it, but there's a lot of things that make up a good personal trainer. But if we were to take the most successful trainers and we were to go to the end on that, you know, particular scale and say, okay, who are the the top, you know, fifteen percent successful trainers in the US, every single one of them has an awesome personality. It's just the bottom line. Yeah. Like clients want to work out with people right. that they, they hang like out with. And it is there's de- and here's the problem with personality is a lot of people think it's a fixed attribute because there's such a strong biological component and of course the way you were raised component but the reality is uh, yes you do have your potential whatever that is but it's a skill that can totally be developed a hundred percent I mean you know Justin talked about bartending and waiting tables a hundred percent that contributed to his ability to approach people when he finally became a trainer because he practiced it because it was a skill. You could almost argue that it, it's it's something that everybody developed, and I just I, I was forced to develop it at a very, develop it at a very young age. Mm-hmm. Being somebody who moved in nine different homes, had different schools, I had to make friends. Right. And as a kid who wants to play and played sports and do things, I wanted to have friends more than I cared about being embarrassed or how no matter how much because it was it wasn't like it was easy for me when I was younger to go walk up to a group of kids. I didn't know and start talking or walk up to a girl and ask her out like that shit. I remember getting butterflies and being nervous and saying stupid shit. But I I, real early on, I learned that the repetition thing that you're speaking to what you're talking about. I got better at it. Like the first time was tough, but then the second time was a little, it was less tough. And then the third time was less tough than that. And then before long, I started to pick up on it that, Hey, you know what? Like this isn't that hard. And you know, what is the worst thing that could happen? They mm-hmm. say no, or they don't mm-hmm. like me or whatever. Like, that, that's the absolute worst. Like, so what? This oh is, yeah. It gets you over the fear. Right. That this that is really, what, that's what the barrier is. And this fear. is why, um, I've worked with a lot and I've known a lot of really great salespeople, uh, in my life. I've known, uh, you know, I know the a real estate agent who's, you know, makes several, do- several million dollars a year in commissions off selling homes. One of the top real estate agents, uh, in the country, I've known car salesmen, I've known uh, salespeople for insurance companies and tech companies who are making tremendous amounts of money, you know, uh, investment bankers who are very good at selling products, who do very, very, very well. But by far the best salespeople I've ever known in my life, believe it or not, were the top salespeople that I knew who sold gym memberships. And it wasn't because, you know, that there's some magic, you know, or whatever that attracts the best people. It's because when you're selling a gym membership, you have about a 30 minute to one hour, 30 to 60 minute sales cycle. And you'll have anywhere between three to 15 of those or more in a day, depending on how big your gym is. And so people who sell gym memberships get a shit ton of reps. Right. Like yeah. if, you're, if you're a good sales person in a really busy gym, 
It's you're like going to serpentine belt. You are going to probably do, you know, I don't know, 300 to, you know, 500, maybe even a thousand sales presentations in a month. Mm-hmm. And so it's yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, close or walk, close or walk. And you're doing so many reps, you get so damn good at selling that I, I know several salespeople that work for me and sold memberships who were good at selling memberships who then left the fitness industry and now are millionaires in their respected fields because, and they all told me the same thing. Like I got a buddy who sells uh, uh, insurance and he's like, he, he, would, he would message me and he'd be like, dude, he goes, this is fucking easy. He goes, this is way easier than selling memberships. I'm killing these guys. All these guys are terrible at closing. He's like, I'm so much better than they are. And then I have another friend who did, you know, uh, 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 home loans or whatever. Same thing. He's like, this is so easy. Like, I can close people so easy because of those repetitions. So think of that. Test yourself out. Try it out. Something else you could do is you can enroll in classes that might help you become more comfortable. Uh, Improv classes are excellent for this. In fact, uh, improv classes have been recommended to salespeople for a long time because it gets you comfortable acting out. I'm glad you went that way too because sales is so directly related to to this having a reserved or not. So normally if you have a reserved personality, you also struggle with sales too. Hmm. Rarely ever do I meet somebody who's like reserved with like, I'm fucking great at sales though. So typically you're, if you're reserved, because you, I mean, it's hard enough to ask someone to be your friend or ask a girl on a date. Asking somebody for $5,000 to invest in you is a whole other monster. They don't even know you. I would way yeah. rather ask some girl that I've never met before, walk up to her and say, would you like to go out for dinner on Friday, than to, to ask somebody who I just spent maybe 30 minutes to an hour with, can I get $5,000? That's a much more challenging situation. Getting five grand from someone is way harder than asking somebody on a date on Friday that you're going to pay for the fucking dinner. I bet like, you there's some people that disagree right now. I bet there's some people are listening like, yeah. no. Yeah. Way, man. Yeah. Sure, but I it's all the same, right? right? You know, well, sh- for sure, there's people that disagree with me. But why is that? That's their own insecurities because yeah. they're afraid of no and rejection. Yes. Once you start to go, who gives a fuck about no and rejection, and you really truly have that attitude, then it's really not that scary at all. And you're really not asking for much. You're asking to buy someone a dinner on Friday night. You're not asking a lot. It's not that hard. The worst thing that could happen. When your dates start getting hotter and hotter. If she says <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. but telling that one, asking somebody for you know thousands of dollars for personal training potentially, that is tough. And that takes some skill and it takes some good conversational skills to lead somebody into being able to say yes to a question like that. And so if you have a reserved personality and you struggle with something like that, you're going to have an uphill battle being a personal trainer because really, I and I used to hate that people don't talk about this enough in fitness. I would say 80% of your job is sales. It, it really is. Of course. It's not programming Easily. and nutrition calculating and getting smarter when it comes to that stuff. That's a very small percent. It really is. The biggest percent of it is communication and selling. And even when you're not technically selling, as I do the air quotes, you really are. Because you're selling every single session. Yes. As you're on the floor and you're teaching mechanics, you're also, you should be selling too while you're doing that. Dude, you're trying to convince people to completely change their lifestyle so they can get in better health. You better fucking sell that shit. Right. You better sell it really good or they're not going to do it. And there's nothing, it's not tangible, so it's even more challenging, right? Uh Well, showing somebody a $100,000 Mercedes who's already at the Mercedes dealership who's looking to buy a Mercedes isn't really as hard of a sale as you think it is. Try getting someone walking in the gym and then painting the picture of what health and fitness looks like for them. Oh, and by the way, you got to change your lifestyle every day. You got to change how you eat every day. And by the way, you're going to pay me right now, but you're not going to get to see it for six months. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, could you imagine selling a Mercedes for a hundred grand and say you, you got to dri- do all the work you don't get to drive it for a year yeah. Yeah. here buy the fuck you. you can buy this mercedes but then you have to build it yeah so you gotta, you gotta spend a, a couple <laughs> yeah, hours a day building build it mercedes you gotta learn yourself. how to build it you gotta learn all about the mercedes. right nothing sexy i'll about hand it. you the parts nothing yeah. sexy about that <laughs> no, so no, no. i mean i like to keep it real with people that ask good questions like this because i think it's a very good question but in my experience i've had an opportunity to probably i don't know lead and manage well over a few hundred personal trainers and you know Having people skills that you can develop uh, is a big part of the gym. So if you if you're not comfortable with doing that, and maybe you don't like sales, you might want to reconsider what exactly you do in fitness, and maybe personal training clients mm-hmm. may not be the best thing. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know what? I've been getting uh, I've been thinking about this for a second. That there's a lot of listeners that maybe don't follow us on our social media outlet of choice, which is Instagram. So if you're not following us, go check us out on Instagram. We do provide different pieces of fitness, nutrition, health information, entertainment. 
or just stuff that we're doing throughout the day. It's also the way that you can contact us and might get a response uh, from one of us. We do get really busy, but we do try to reply to everybody. The place to find us on social media is Instagram, and we're all uh, Mind Pump and then our name. So I'm Mind Pump Sal, Mind Pump Adam, and then we have Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.